hey, here we are. Pretty much the final part of the whole hazard assessment process, and that's the application of controls. Really intuitively, when we got to consider the application of controls, we have to consider how it's done. So just a quick review on the hierarchy of controls. If you want to know more about the hierarchy of controls, please pay attention up on this corner of the video, because what I'll do is I'll insert a quick link on a video that I did previously regarding the hierarchy of controls. But the hierarchy of controls is basically a process on where we set the best controls all the way down to the least valued or the least best control, if you will. And so we have elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE. As I said, if you want some good examples of each, just pay attention to that upper corner and there'll be a video, a link to a video on the hierarchy of controls. But one of the most important things when you're looking at controls is the context in applying the controls. I've seen it lots, especially on construction sites where you have a person who works in the construction trailer, doesn't leave it. They're an administrative assistant, accountant, controller, whatever the case may be. Yet there they are with an orange vest on and sometimes even wearing a hard hat, which is just weird, but uh, whatever. That is completely taken out of context. Realistically, they don't leave the, the trailer at all, except maybe to go to the washroom or whatever. And they're still wearing this orange vest. Now, I'm whatever your company requirements are, I'm not making any comments, but wouldn't it be better if we're getting them to apply controls in context? Maybe hang up their vest at the door when they come in and then have a sign beside the uh, where they're hanging their vests or on the door that say orange vests or high-vis vests must be worn beyond this point. Because then they're applying the controls in context. It's like a lot of people will consider a fire alarm as fire prevention. It prevents no evacuation. In other words, what it does is it alerts the occupants of the building that there's a fire and they need to evacuate and go to a safe area. What would be good fire prevention? Making sure that smoke alarms are installed, making sure that sprinklers are in areas where they need to be, and making sure that there's written uh, administrative processes for the storage and use of flammable products within a building or storing them outside of the building, maybe eliminating the process al altogether. That's why a hazard assessment needs to be done and the controls applied in context. So we're not stuffing all the controls in a bucket and just firing them at the hazard without thought. There should be some thought that goes into this. As I said, we uh, created this risk matrix. Send me a link for that, will you? Link, yeah, there's a link down below. But how do we apply controls? So the best way to do it is quantify the controls. Now, a quick warning, I have not quantified elimination or substitution. Quick explanation why. If you're going to quantify elimination, then what you need to do is have it so that it zeroes out everything. So rather than worry about that, don't do something twice. Don't bother quantifying elimination. Hear me out, you'll see why in a bit. I also don't quantify substitution. The reason being is because if we're going to substitute something, that means we've fully assessed the hazard, figured out that a part of that task or the whole entire task is dangerous and we need to substitute or treat something within it. So in doing so, we need to reassess the process and reassess the, uh, the task after the substitution is applied. So it really doesn't make sense. However, they should be noted because once you do the whole hazard assessment, find out that it's still too dangerous to be done or there's too many hazards present, then what you can do is either work in some uh, elimination or work in some substitution and then reassess the whole task after those two controls have been applied. But, so what I've done here is I quantify engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE. I give engineering a three, administrative a two, and PPE a one, because it's the least favored among the controls. The idea being that when it comes to uh, controls, we apply each of them and give them a score, and that works into the quantified process and the equation a lot better because without any kind of quantification of controls, we have no way of determining what the hazard level is after the application of controls. One of the pitfalls that people fall into is they will add a total each time that they Im implement a control. So if they have two or three engineering controls, they'll give it a score of six or nine. And that's not the case. Just score each one once because you're always gonna be left with a residual risk and it enables you to go back and say, you know what? 
No matter what, this is still too hazardous. We're going to reassess this and we're either going to eliminate something or we're going to substitute something or we're going to change the shift or do something totally different. And then what it does is enables you to go back and reassess that hazard again. Engineering three, administrative two, PPE one. Let's put it into a real world exercise. Remember that administrative assistant? Hey, just a quick interruption from this video. I'm busy editing it right now. And I thought about one thing is mentioning the previous hazard assessment and risk assessment done with the admin assistant. So I tell you what, you can actually click on the video up in this corner and watch that video and return back to this one. Or I don't know, maybe bookmark this one and come watch it again later. Either way, it's up to you. But it's important to have the understanding of a risk assessment in context where we assess the risk first, put a value to the risk or quantify the risk and then apply controls. So anyway, uh, let's back to the video. Take care, see you in a bit. She was at a high degree of risk having a chronic injury due to static positioning. So what we need to do is we need to apply some controls and reduce it. And we need to have some evidence in case we have to buy or something new or purchase, make some purchases. And this is the best way to do it. So what are the controls that we're gonna need? First off, an engineering control. One of the best engineering controls that you're going to have is an ability to redesign the workstation so it better fits the person because we can't redesign the person. Doesn't work. Doesn't work that way. And the best way to do that is having everything adjustable. So let's take some engineering controls, which are going to be an adjustable chair, an adjustable desk and monitor arms for. And that way that she can have everything to the height that she needs to have where it will reduce any strain on her joints, like her neck, her shoulders, her elbows and her wrists, and of course her hips and back. Next thing we need to do is have an administrative control in place so that we can describe to the worker how they're going to work. So that means we have to have some guidelines in the desk set up, some guidelines on how to adjust her chair, her desk, etc. So we have to have those written instructions and then the training in place to make sure that she's able to do it. So this is the application of the engineering controls. So we've got three, two. Can we apply PPE? No, she doesn't need to wear a hard hat or a high vis vest, but what we can do is we can uh, put some guards or some padding along any of the uh, sharp surfaces or hard surfaces that she may come in contact with. Now, these aren't necessarily, a lot of people might not consider them PPE, but because they wear out and they're very close to the worker and adjacent to the worker, we might wanna consider them as PPE just for this exercise alone. So yes, we'll give it a score of one. So what we've done now is we've taken that 12 and we've brought it down to a six, and there's where it sits within the risk matrix. So you see how we take and we look at the, calculate the risk, and then we apply controls to reduce the probability of a hazard occurring. It's a simple process, we can use it for everything, and this whole process should evolve throughout your whole entire health and safety program. If we're applying this to the different pieces of our health and safety program, we'll find we'll have some very concrete methods in identifying hazards, assessing them properly, and then applying those controls to reduce the hazards and make the whole workplace safer. Hey, if you liked the video, do me a favor, let me know. Just give it a click down below. It'll make me very happy. I'll be so happy. If you think somebody else will benefit from this video, why don't you share it? Cause you know, after all, sharing is caring. If you're new to the channel and you haven't subscribed yet, just click the subscribe button, ding the bell. You'll get notified of new content. And that's very important. Hey, until we see each other again, do me a favor. Don't just think about safety. Don't just talk about safety, but wherever you end up, do safety. Take care. Bye for now.